the next thing that was intrinsic in this model that's now been trashed of one continuous gene, one continuous gene, what we just figured out is instead you can have the intron exons, all of that. The next thing that went down the tubes was looking at, well, how much of DNA is actually devoted to coding for amino acids? And the answer was obvious. Like 99.99%, each one of these would just have to have a stop codon, a stop signal at the end. And otherwise, this was just a continuous flow of information once you have factored in these intron things. Okay, so they're part of this gene, but immediately starts the next one. The next major discovery was one gene would very rarely start immediately after the next one. There would be long stretches of DNA in between that didn't code for a protein, non-coding DNA. That's mighty puzzling. Like, what's that, just junk or stuff? And around that time, the phrase junk DNA was actually floating around, people trying to make sense of this. And when people sat and started actually like doing the numbers, out came a number that knocked people on their rears. It was so flabbergasting. 95% of DNA is non-coding. 95% does not code for a gene specifying a protein. In other words, in between here on the average would be a stretch of DNA 19 times the length of that or whatever the math winds up being. And suddenly calling that stuff junk DNA started seeming a little bit tenuous because 95% of your DNA just can't be packing material for the whole thing. It's gotta be doing something. And during that period, came sort of the insight into this that all that, all that intervening non-coding stuff was, what was that? That was the instruction booklet. That was the instruction booklet on when to activate these genes. That was the on and off switches for turning genes on or off. Upstream in the non-coding domain, just above a particular gene sequence, would be the information for when that gene is activated. Activated when it makes RNA into protein, all of that. And upstream of that are the on and off switches. Implication right there off the bat, which is Crick was wrong. DNA sequences are not the starting point of the central dogma of life, and DNA is the rule giver and all of that. DNA is being regulated. Genes are being regulated in some other way, and where 95% of DNA is being devoted to regulation of the genes. DNA has no idea what it's doing. DNA is a readout that's under the control of all sorts of other factors. And out of this emerged the really, really important concepts of regulatory sequences upstream from genes. So here we have a long string of DNA coding for this gene, which happens to come in two exons. And it is like the space between a galaxy, how long the non-coding is going to go on until the next gene is back there. So what's going on in this stretch just upstream for this gene? Things that were soon being called stuff like promoter sequences or repressor sequences, things, stretches of DNA that coded for switches rather than coding for protein, that coded for things coming in to the neighborhood of the DNA and binding to some of these promoter or repressor sequences and then turning on, or in some cases off, the transcription of that gene, the process of the gene generating proteins. You would have promoters sitting there and this is overly literal, it would be just a sequence of DNA, which thanks to that sequence would have a certain subtle micro shape, and along would come something which happened to be able to fit perfectly into that spot, and if and only if this molecule, usually a protein, bound to this promoter, suddenly that would trigger a whole bunch of enzymes to come in, which would start the process of transcribing this gene. This would be the switch, and this is the thing that just turned the switch on. And these things that turn the switches on, or off in some cases, were soon called transcription factors. 
totally critical concept in there. The fact that vast stretches of DNA don't code for anything. Instead, they have the instruction booklets. Here's how you turn this gene on or off. Send in this molecular messenger, send in this type of transcription factor, and if it shows up, binds to here, you now activate the transcription of this gene, the process of turning that gene, making proteins derived from it. This is where the information was. And this is not DNA knowing what it's doing. This is outside regulators coming in. So immediately, that has made life a whole lot more complicated. Next complications, you could have different genes scattered all over the place that would have the same promoter upstream of it. What would that mean? In comes a transcription factor, and it doesn't activate the transcription of one gene producing one protein. It activates the transcription of a whole bunch of them. In other words, now suddenly we have messengers that could trigger activation of genetic networks, entire arrays of proteins being produced, all with a functional similarity driven by the fact that all of them have the same promoter upstream. So suddenly you have the possibility of the same promoter being upstream regulating more than one gene. That is the general rule. Flip side of it. Any given gene, for example, could have a bunch of different promoters responding to different types of signals. So now, suddenly, you have this gene which can be transcribed under this circumstance or under this circumstance, and both are ways of turning on activation of that gene. And in this circumstance, the same promoter is found in genes A, B, and C, somewhere at the other end of the chromosome. And in this case, this promoter is found on genes D, E, and F down there, different networks. So the same sort of transcription factor logic, once you can have different promoters upstream of a gene, and once you can have the same promoter upstream from multiple genes, you suddenly have the ability with different transcription factors to activate entire networks of gene expression.